It is good to be back in the house tonight. It's good to see you one. Thank you for God's giving us this time, this opportunity to come and meet together again. Thank you for the blessings and mercies he supplied. The way he's took care of us, the way he's watched over us. He's been better to us than we ever deserved. And I know tonight that everything we've got is from him. And I don't ever want to forget the blessing. More than anything tonight, thankful that he loves us enough to send Jesus to die. Send him to shed that blood. Thankful that blood is sufficient to cleanse me of my sins. Open your Bibles tonight, if you will, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Again, I thank God for the day, for the way he's took care of us. Thankful that he has allowed us to come and meet back together again this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and I'm going to skip around a couple of different verses in this chapter, and I know at some point I've probably used all of them, but uh, I, I can tell you I've never used them quite like this before. So I hope tonight you've come praying, I hope tonight you've come lifting me up and asking God to bless me and use me. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken them thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling ox and sheep, cattle and ass. In verse 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Verse number 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you again, we thank you for the day that you gave us and for the way you took care of us. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing and mercy you supplied. You've been better to me than I ever deserved, and I know, God, that it's all from you. I thank you for the help and strength you give us just to be able to get up and go this morning and thank you for bringing us through a day, keeping us safe from harm and danger. I thank you, Father, this evening for the privilege we have now at the end of the day to come back and meet together again at your house. Lord, I appreciate each one of these that's come out tonight. I'm thankful that we've got this opportunity to come and meet together. I'm thankful, Father, for every home and family that's gathered here this evening. And God, I thank you most of all tonight for saving. I thank you, Jesus, and blood that shed at Calvary. Thank you tonight. He was willing to do it all. Left nothing out, left nothing undone, but with that cross died in my place, did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Father, can I forgive me for what I failed you? Forgive me for I've let you down for the things I've said, done, and thought that was displeasing. I pray you remove them and take them away. Thank you, Lord, for the service, for the songs that were sung, for the testimony spoken. It's always good to hear people brag on you. But God, right now, I need your help. I need your touch. I need your Father to come down and overshadow this place with your spirit. I need that fresh and order from on high. I need your Father this evening, please. Give me the words that you have me to say. I pray, God, tonight that you watch my mouth. Don't let me say it wrong. Don't let me lead anybody astray. But only help me to say that which would be pleasing in your sight. Hide me. I beg you behind that cross. Let people realize it's not about me, but it's about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Go with us through the rest of the service. Help me 
to say exactly what you had me to say. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last couple of nights, I had the privilege of being over at Freedom. Able to hear Brother Tony preach for two nights. I'm going to be honest with you if you look at the two messages you heard Monday night and Tuesday night, some of the same that he preached here when he was here. But everything, it always, I don't care what a preacher tries to do, something's going to be said that wasn't said first time around. There's always something going to be different. I don't care, he might even use the same point, but something is going to be different. I sat there last night, and though I ain't attempted to steal one of his messages, but I got sat there last night, and began to talk about Job and how Job was a man that was approved of God. And I just about cried sitting there in my seat and it wasn't even invitation time. That should be the greatest desire of every child of God that's alive today. And that's to be approved of a holy and a righteous God. Amen. In this passage of Scripture, Saul is given a direct command from God and told what to do. And he didn't do it. Halfway obedience is still disobedience any way you want to look at it. He had instructions to totally destroy the Amalekites. If you look in verse number 3, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling ox and sheep, camel and ass. That's pretty plain on what he was supposed to do. But then in verse number 9, we realize Saul did a half job. It says, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed Utterly. You say, well, preacher, they defeated them. But to defeat is not to destroy. Because when you defeat, something can still come back. And because Saul did not obey God in destroying the Amalekites, Verse 23 says, the end of it, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Saul was disapproved of God. Saul was rejected of God because Saul disobeyed God. We will never be approved of God as long as we're in disobedience to God. And until things in our life, anything that we have that is contrary to the Word of God, as long as it is in our life and it's got a hold on us, we might keep it down below the surface. You say, preacher, what do you... All right, let me just show you some examples. There have been times in all of our lives before we got saved, there were words that we used and did not bother us when we used them. And when we get saved, God will touch your tongue. But once in a while, something could happen and a word you ain't said in 20 years, you might not say it, but you might think it. It ain't been destroyed, it's just been defeated. There 
could have been times in your life that you had a problem with alcohol before you got saved. And God might have took that desire away from you. And that problem is defeated. But then on a real hot afternoon when you've been outside working and the sweat's pouring and you're trying to find a little bit of shade and the devil will pop it back in your mind how good a cold Budweiser would have tasted right then. It's defeated. But it ain't destroyed. There are things in our life that before we're ever going to be proved of God, they may have to just be put down completely. There might be weaknesses that we have. There might be temptations that bother us. And I'm going to be honest with you, folks. The only way that we're ever going to destroy them is to say, God, take it and go with it. Get it out. But we sometimes will still maybe go somewhere to eat where alcohol is served. Or we'll turn a program on television and the language is not appropriate and yet we won't turn it off. We'll keep watching it. Am I making any sense at all? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil was defeated at the cross of Calvary. He's not going to be destroyed until he gets to the lake of fire. You say, well, he don't bother me none. Well, you ain't doing nothing for God. Because if you're doing something for God, I realize that Jesus defeated him at Calvary, but he's still trying to defeat me. Quick message tonight, the simple message. Just hang on. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. We know that when he came out of that tomb, he defeated death. But death has not been destroyed yet because people are still dying. But there's going to come a day when he says, Behold, I make all things new. And there shall be no more sorrow, no sickness, no pain or death, for the former things are passed away. There's going to come a day that death is destroyed. What do we have in our life that we have not put down? What do we have in our life that, and when I say put down, I mean just that. That might be something in our life we need to shoot in the head just like we would a dog with rabies. There might be something in our life that we got to totally get away from any anything that would even come close to tempting us for what our weaknesses are. The devil knows your weakness, he knows mine. And as long as those weaknesses even still pop in our mind, I look at myself as a failure just as much as we look at Saul as a failure. I told you before, anything that you've ever, ever done, you are still capable and subject to do it again. Whether it's cuss somebody out or just smack the daylights out of them. If Brother Paul upsets me and I get back there and I'm biting my lip 
and I'm sitting there seated, and what I really want to do is grab him. I'll use a Jerry Clower phrase, grab him in his Adam's apple and just <laughs> then I'm not approved of God yet. And he hadn't, by the way. I'm just. When we are saved by the grace of God, we are to die out to self. We're to crucify our flesh daily. I'm to take my fleshly wants and desires and literally lay them down on the altar of God, kill them right there, and walk away from Him. Walk away. At the end of World War I, there was a whole lot of Germans who refused to accept defeat, even though they were. They had Runaway inflation. They had massive unemployment. They had an economic collapse. And by 1933, there was a veteran soldier who had founded the Socialist Party and became Chancellor of Germany. His name was Adolf Hitler. As he began to build the army back up with revenge in his mind, that's all he thought. He proved it when he started rolling into Poland and Czechoslovakia. Just hear me, I'll make sense, I'll be done in just a minute. Britain and France saw exactly what was going on, but they did not want to repeat of what had just ended in 1919. That was the great war, the war to end all wars. And yet Hitler started building back up out of the ashes of a defeated Germany. The end result was six million Jews dying and the development of a bomb that could totally wipe out mankind. The French and the Germans said, if we ignore him, he'll go away. We just leave him alone. We don't want war again. I look tonight, and I look at my country, I look at my home, I look at my church, and I say, is God does God approve? I know it don't approve of my country. But I don't care what you... You say, what was your point with Hitler? I'll tell you, man. I know it don't approve of my country because of the way things are going. Lives mean nothing. Innocent lives mean nothing. Abominable lifestyles mean nothing because everybody wants their own freedom to do as they please. And you take out one liberal politician, there's ten more sitting there ready to step up. You can't defeat sin without destroying sin. And put something in place where it can't come back. I see things that are going on in the nation today and I see people who are caught dead to rights and they sit on death row for 25 or 30 years and they sit on there long enough they don't even remember why they're being executed. If they're ever executed. Well, the Bible makes it plain what's supposed to happen to them. You say, preacher, do you think capital punishment would deter first degree murder? I guarantee you, everybody that ever set foot in the gas chamber never killed anybody in it. Yeah. 
I look at my home. Is God approved in my home? We pray before we eat. We pray together every morning. We don't lay out of church. We both spend time reading our Bible. We try to do the things that God would have us to do. And yet again, there are times that things will come in my mind from way back yonder. And then I say, God, I no. 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 Guess you're proven of my home. And gentlemen, let me just say this to you right now. If you sit back and you say, Well, preacher, I try to leave my home right, but my wife does this or my children does that, uh uh, that don't work, gentlemen. God has told us we're the head of the house. And it don't matter if your wife, my wife, your children, my children, whoever's living under the roof that's ours, we're held accountable for what we do. Look at the church. And I see. Is God approved? If He wrote us a letter like He wrote in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, what would He say? Would He say that we come up short on love? Would He say that there's things done here just to bring glory on ourselves? Does He say we really don't care about people outside the walls of this church or else we'd be out there trying to invite them to church. Do we really pray for those who are on that prayer list and that is going through sicknesses and going through sorrows and facing things? Are we really lifting them up before a holy and a righteous God? Or we just look at that prayer list and go through the motions? When we come to the house of God and gather together, what are we here for? Are we truly here to worship Him? Are we here to just be seen? Are we here to come in so the preacher won't think we're heathens. If we don't have the love, that lack of love has to be destroyed. If we don't care about lost people, that unconcern has to be destroyed. If we're not praying for those that are on that prayer list, and I'm going to say this one more time. If we were praying for them like we ought to be praying for them and seeking God's face, they would come off of that prayer list in some other way other than dying. If we aren't praying like we ought to, that lack of concern, care, and compassion needs to be destroyed. What happened to Germany? They were defeated. But it was still there. And the reason they were able to build back up is because they weren't destroyed. So let's look at ourselves. Let's look at ourselves. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify therefore your members. What does that mean? That means to kill. 
That's the word that, the, that, that mortician comes from. It means to dig. It means to kill. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. If you hear it ain't married, you should not have any lustful desires over anybody. Okay. Have I lost all of you? Have I not made any sense at all? Unclean. Inordinate affection. And inordinate affection is lust. That goes, I don't care if you're if you're looking at your at your neighbor's car, his truck, his house, his suit of clothes, how much land he's got, the crop he got in this year. Evil concupiscence. That is literally, and there ain't no young ones in here tonight. That literally means strong sexual desire. If you looking at somebody, I ain't trying to be ugly. Man, I used to have to walk away from people when I was working at the battery plant called some of the language. They wouldn't shut up. And under God, it was getting as bad with women as it was with men. And covetousness, which is idolatry. When we covet, we want something that belongs to somebody else and we get to the point we want it so bad, it becomes an idol to us. And when he says, mortify therefore your members upon this earth, what he's saying is, kill that desire. Kill those things. If we want to be approved of God, if there are things in our life that are ungodly, unscriptural, we got to put them down. Or we're never going to be approved of God. If we have, and don't take this the wrong way, I've said it a many a time, if we've got special singers that get up here on Sunday night and they decide they're singing and y'all look at me and look how good I am and realize I never hit a sour note and I'm always on time and I don't never mess nothing up and look at me. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to this. You need to sit down. If you can't kill that feeling, sit down. Because God is not going to honor it. If the preacher, and you listen to me, in the last year or so especially, I've had the privilege to meet some great men of God. Some maybe y'all hadn't heard of. Some that I have watched and listened to and heard. And elderly gentleman down in Alabama by the name of Mike Allison. I'm going to tell you what. That man blesses my heart. Brother Tony blesses my heart. Brother Shelton Smith blesses my heart. Brother Paul Sis blesses my heart. And let me tell you something. I understand that I'm never going to be the kind of preacher they are. I'm never going to be somebody who's going to go all over the place to preach the gospel. And can I tell you something? I would honestly say in the depths of my soul, I am a bit jealous. I thank God for the way God's using them. I mean that. That's something I don't have to kill. <coughs> What I do have to kill once in a while is, God, I sure would like to preach this message. I could set somebody on fire with this right here. And I've told you, well, what's, what's it been? Three, four weeks ago, there's something I was really wanting to preach, and God flat made it abundantly clear, no, you're not. But as long as those things even get in my mind, I don't feel like I'm ever going to be approved of God. Sunday school teachers, you ought to get it 110%. Everything you've got ought to be given to that lesson. I don't care how many or how few's in there.
We have to kill our own desires. We have to kill our own feelings. It is not about us. It is about Him. We are bought with a price. We're not our own. And the greatest desire we ought to have tonight is to be approved of God and not be rejected the way King Saul was. Mark chapter 14, it's the night before the crucifixion. They're up in the upper room. Jesus looks at the crowd. There's 12 of them there. He knows what's in the heart of Judas because in just a couple of minutes after he says this, he's going to look at him and say, That thou doest, do quickly. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus calls him clean. And Judas has the audacity to call him master. But in Mark chapter 14, as they're sitting at the table, he says, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they begin to be sorrowful. And to say unto him, one by one, Is it I? And I said, is it I? I think it's the gospel according to Matthew. They all begin to ask the question, is it I? And Jesus, uh, Judas even has the nerve to look at him and say, is it I? And Jesus said, thou sayest. Let's think about it tonight for our nation. For our home, for our church. If my nation is not approved of God, am I part of the reason why? If my home is not approved of God, am I part of the reason why? If my church is not approved of God, am I part of the reason why? And I think it would behoove every last one of us. And I said us. I didn't say y'all. To ask that question. Lord. Is it I? Lord is it me? Am I holding it back? Am I keeping my nation from being what it ought to be? And you say preacher. You can't help. What the government officials do. Yeah, we either put them in or take them out. You say, preacher, what about your home? God, am I the one? Am I, am I doing something in my home to keep it from being approved of God? Do I let things come into my house? I told you several years ago, I think it was, watching a program one night on television. Gwen walked by and she said, you think you really ought to be watching that? And they wasn't cussing and carrying on. They wasn't nothing dirty. The name of the program was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She said, do you think you really ought to be watching that? And I said, you know what? No. I shouldn't be. And that come back to mind last night when Brother Tony said he'd get on the radio in his truck and he'd hear something come on and he'd say, oh, I like that. And the Spirit of God would say, no, you don't. He'd say, yeah, really, I do. He'd say, no, you don't. And to be approved of God, I need to take my desires and put them down. and replace them with God's desires. If my church is not approved of God, am I the reason? Am I? You know, this past August made 18 years that I've been here. A part of you probably figures that was 18 too many.
But I'm thinking, God, I don't want to lead them around in circles. We don't need to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Is it I? It's just an 11 day trip from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barney that took them 40 years. Round in circles. Lord, is it I? Do you know why it took them 40 years? They had to die before they could go into the promised land. That generation that did not believe God, that generation who was short on faith, that generation that wanted to do it themselves instead of doing it the way God had instructed Moses to do it, that generation who was disobedient, unthankful, they had to die. I would hate to have to be the one that had to die before God approved my home or approved my church. Mm -hmm. So, well, preacher, give it 22 more years. That'll be 40 years. In 22 years, I'll be 85 years old if God lets me live that long. And I doubt y'all keep me that long. Which leads me to the very end and I'm done. They had to die. The last one to die was Moses. That's why God said, Moses, today, get you up on Mount Nebo. You're going to die. You get Joshua, you get Joshua in front of all the people, you pass it to him, you let them know that he's got my approval. But Moses, Aaron's dead, Miriam's dead, everybody in that generation is dead except Moses. Moses still, because Moses was alive, they couldn't cross over Jordan into the promised land. Do we want to be approved of God? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Am I the one holding the church back? Am I the one keeping the church from having your stamp of approval? Am I the one that's going to have to die for the church to quit going in circles? He said, Preacher, it don't get to those extremes. About seven, eight, nine years ago, I tried to preach a message out of Psalm 109. I started it Sunday morning, made a lot of people mad, finished it up Sunday night, made a lot of other people mad. But if there are people who are holding back, and you go back and you read Psalm 109, read it all, get in context. But the psalmist said, let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Mm -hmm. The psalmist said, we need to pray for them to die. You know what to take guts? It's to come before the throne of judgment. To come before a holy and righteous God, bow on our knees, and say, God, if I'm the one that's causing your lack of approval, take me out now. You say, Preacher, I don't know that I want to pray like that. Well, if we ain't willing to pray like that, then we might be the one. Saul, you didn't utterly destroy what was supposed to be destroyed. Defeating it was not enough. 
Had the Allies destroyed Germany in World War I, probably wouldn't have been in World War II. If we would destroy the temptations of the devil in our life, we wouldn't walk around like we were totally defeated most of the time. And then when we look around at the things that we're involved in and we say, am I the one, Lord, is it I? Am I part of it? Am I keeping us from being approved as we should be? And then say, Lord, if I'm the hold up, if I'm the blockage, if I'm the one that's keeping your stamp of approval. Folks, the worst thing that could ever happen to our home would be for us to get a message from God like Eli got that said, Eli, because you're not controlling your children, I'm going to destroy your name and there's not going to be any of your descendants left. The worst thing that could happen to our nation is for God to say, I'm going to destroy it. Read the first couple of chapters of Amos when you get home in the Old Testament. And he talks about those nations he's going to destroy. And he says, not for just one or two sins, but for a multitude. The worst thing that could happen in our life as a child of God, the worst thing that could happen is for us to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and to hear the words, Wayne, you're the reason that I some Baptist church went around in circles. Wayne, you're the reason that I some Baptist church didn't grow. You're the reason that I some Baptist church got stagnant. You said, preacher, how can I know it's me? Well, let me ask you this. If everybody in the church had the same prayer life like you've got, how much praying would truly get take place? If everybody in the church read their Bible exactly like one of you read yours, how much knowledge of the Word of God would be in this church? If everybody in this church who are members of this church were as faithful as any of us here, How many people would we have here? If we hang our head in shame. If I have to hang my head in shame, then I'd have to admit that I'm a good part of the reason that God's stamp of approval is not here. I told you before, when I get to the judgment seat of Christ, my prayer life, my Bible reading, He's going to ding, ding me on so bad. You say, don't you read your Bible? Sure I do. Don't you pray? Sure I do. Don't you go to church? Sure I do. When you come here, preacher, don't you worship God? Sure I do. I don't come here to be worshipped. I come here to worship. But if everybody did it like me, what would we have? If everybody's doing it like I'm doing it. If everybody's doing it like you're doing it. Saul, 
You defeated them, but you didn't destroy them. Saul, you were disobedient, which means you're rejected. Saul, you're not approved of God. So God's got somebody else to take your place. Wonder what went through old Eli's mind when Samuel walked up to him that morning and Eli said, Samuel, you tell me what God said and don't you hold nothing back. And Samuel told him what God said. And Eli said, yeah, it's the Lord. To know that that little fellow there that ain't old enough to shave probably wasn't even old enough to wear long breeches. Eli looks at him and said, that's my replacement right there. Because I'm not approved of God. I let him down. I fail him. I come short. But I think it's about time for us to be honest and say we all do. question we need to ask ourselves tonight and I don't need to ask it about Brother Doug Brother Doug don't need to ask it about Brother Kenny, Brother Kenny don't need to ask it about Brother Garland God do I have your stamp of approval God are you do you approve of what I'm doing or you reject me and I'm not talking about losing your salvation I sure don't want to have being empty handed when I come out of the judgment seat of Christ. It's not enough just to defeat. We've got to destroy the things that are in our life that are not approved of in the sight of God. We don't need to just put them in a back room. We need to take them to the landfill and set fire to them. greatest thing tonight we need have God's approval on our homes have God's approval on our church have God's approval on our nation but to do that there's some things in our life that need to be destroyed Father we thank you for being here we thank you for these that's come out we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be in your house tonight I truly appreciate every home and family that's represented here. I thank you, Lord, tonight for the privilege we've had to look at a portion of your word. And I pray, God, tonight I said exactly what you had me to say. God, I pray I said it in the right way. Not trying to make anybody mad. God, you know my heart tonight. Not trying to make anybody mad. Not trying to upset anybody. Not trying to jump on anybody. But God, tonight, help me. <coughs> help me! Help me to take those things that are my weaknesses and put them down! Help me to take those things that would cause disapproval of you on my life and destroy them, not just Put them in the back room, but get rid of them. God, I want your approval on my home. I want your approval on my church. And God, with your help and praying before we ever mark a ballot, I want your approval on my nation. I don't want to go the way of the Roman Empire. I don't want to go the way of the Egyptian Empire. I don't want to go the way of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Medes. God, I want my nation to stand. God, the only way it's going to stand is to be built on the rock. Go with us. 
through the rest of this service and have your way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.